Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. This is our Group of Five Deep Dive. I'm Mike Calabri, joined as always by Mike Ionello. We're back after a not-so-hot week five, but this is, you know, the heart of Conference USA season, MAC season. Shout-out to them playing games during the week. Like, this is not the time to pull off on the accelerator. It's time to get right back up on that horse. As I mentioned, I took it on the chin in week five. But I actually really enjoyed this slate. You know, going through, there was multiple games. I, you know, I felt that there was a few pesky underdogs that could win outright. I felt that way a couple weeks ago. It was one of my biggest weeks of the entire season. So I'm coming back with confidence here. But I'll kick it to you first, Ionello, in terms of where your head's at. I know that you basically treaded water in the action app there in week five. How do you view week six now that we get into really in earnest conference play across the board. No more of these little sisters, the poor catching 30 plus points against the big dogs. Now every single game feels like, you know, it's within let's call it three to 11 points on the board in G five land. What do you think about that? Yeah. I think the tightness almost makes me makes the plays less obvious. You know, normally I would say Mm -hmm. we record this uh, Tuesday nights, you know, normally by this point, I probably have eight, nine, 10 bets on the board already. that just, seem off immediately upon openers you know i i got i have three bets on my card that i've actually placed so far i'll probably the ones i i give out tonight i'll probably bet them later tonight but like i bet texas on opener and that was pretty much the only thing i bet sunday so i actually i don't love this like the card at at first glance because i do think the lines tend to be more accurate as we get further in they're a little sharper and i'm finding less of an obvious edge um so we'll see we'll see how it goes like you said my my hot streak did come to a close i went 10 and 11 so yeah treaded water could have been worse but the 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 fuego-ness is officially gone <laughs> well i know it can always get you into a good mood who is your group of five hero from week five i know you like to spin a good yarn a good tail whether it's an administrator a referee you know a special teams coordinator like who are you going with here or is it a player on the field I almost did one of those again, but I was like, I, I've done it like three weeks in a row. So I'm going to go with a player in the field. You may owe an apology because my G5 here of the week, Arkansas State quarterback, Jalen Rayner. We have gone from Butch don't kill my vibe to Butch better have my money because he's about to get himself an extension, Breeze. They, they've won three games in a row. True. They have, won three game, they have won three games in a row. They've looked really dynamic in offense. And I nearly pulled the absolute reverse jinx. I, I almost wanted to parlay this together. Am I going to play Dilfer and Butch, Butch Jones in the same week? Because both of them are catching points, and I don't really see that. I think the UAB line should be closer to a pick I'm not actually going to pull the trigger on the Blazers, but like I don't know. Arkansas State catching, what is it, 17 against Troy? This quarterback has totally changed their entire identity. And someone we talked about year over year when JT Shrout came in for James Blackman. I know that Blackman didn't set the world on fire last year, but the drop-off was so significant. And now this kid comes out of nowhere. He's their white knight to save you know their entire season for the Red Wolves. I don't know. I think this is a great pick for your G5 hero. Yeah, true freshman. He's made two starts, smoked Southern Miss, smoked UMass. He threw six touchdowns against UMass last week, completed 80% of his passes. In his two starts, he's accounted for 11 touchdowns. And to your point, I'm not betting him against Troy because I think I think Troy's starting to wake up. But I just pulled up their schedule. We, I will be back in Arkansas State in the near future if Rainer keeps looking like this. Next week, they're at home against Coastal, who does not look good. And they'll probably be catching a similar double-digit number there. And then after that, they got ULM, which will probably be a closer line. Those are those are two games I, I could be looking to back the Red Wolves. My G5 hero, I'm going to go with Judy McLean, the commissioner of Conference USA. You know, they got rid of the, the dash, the hyphen in CUSA. That's not the reason why I'm picking her here. She brought Conference USA football to Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I love this. I love when the G5 commissioners get the school presidents together and it's like, let's be innovative. I know that this, and she's clear about this. She didn't create this. She's stealing this from the Mac, but she can look at TV ratings. She can look at exposure. They bring in, you know, all kinds of consulting firms to sit down with them. It worked for the Mac. They got a bump. It is difficult logistically, but she walked through every athletic department, every school president, made assurances, tried to balance out the schedule, and she got it done. And we're the beneficiaries. Like the fact of the matter is I'm going to be sitting down Tuesdays and Wednesdays now with twice as much football to watch, you know, once we get into Maction. 
And that's a great thing. I love it. And I think it gives the proper spotlight to some of these teams. And one of them I'm going to talk about in a second with Jacksonville State. Like, I'm excited that they're going to be on national television. I think it's a great get for Conference USA. And it's really all because of her. She's one of, uh, you know, the trailblazers from, uh, you know, a female and power perspective in college sports in general. And I think she deserves to be a hero. What are your thoughts on Conference USA basically ripping off the Mac, but giving us double the action midweek? Yeah, I love it. I think it's perfect for these schools to get, you know, other than us, that's kind of why we do this pod is because we know people aren't watching any of these teams on Saturday. They're watching CBS, Georgia, Auburn, or whoever. So that's why we spend all our time watching the, you know, quote unquote bad football. So you guys don't have to. That's kind of our purpose. I think if these conferences were smart too, like, yeah, they kind of float day to day. Like the way Mac, own, you, when you think Mac, the Mac, you think Tuesday nights. I think it would be so awesome if we get to a point where it's like, Mac owns Tuesday, CUSA owns Wednesday, Sunbelt owns Thursday, and you just like, that's what the Pac-12 screwed up, is they kind of had a good thing going with those like late night Friday night games, and then they kind of got away with it because their good teams kept losing on Friday nights. But like, that's what the Pac-12 should have done. They should just play Oregon, Washington State Friday night every single week next year. Um, yeah, I love it. I think these G5 teams, they should start it sooner, and they should go all the way in, own a, a day of the week. It, it's perfect. The last thing I just want to kind of speak into existence from an innovation standpoint, there's these rumors that the remaining Pac-12 schools, all two of them, and the Mountain West, if they came together, why don't we try to put together some kind of relegation and, you know, demotion, promotion kind of situation, just like uh, English Premier League soccer? That's the kind of outside the box thinking that I want from a G5 conference that may be aspiring to, you know, the Power Six, the way that the AAC got in there. Yeah, I mean, why not? So hopefully that those conversations lead to some fruitful action in, in the coming years, because I'd hate to see West Coast football just be, you know, the the four Pac-12 schools that went to the Big Ten. But we won't waste any more time on that front. Let's get into the best bets. You've been trending better here in the last three weeks. We'll start with you. What's your best bet for week six? To be fair, I've been trending better, but I still have not won a best bet. Last week, I was smart. Remember I told you I teased that I had kind of flipped my best bet? Last week, my best bet was Western Kentucky, who I put in the high five in cash. And I put Akron as my best bet, and they lost. Well, this week... Well, they were tied in regulation. So, I mean, if anyone was listening in last week, they got to stay of execution. They're not in podcast prison just yet, but they're hanging on by their fingernails. So, spoiler alert, this isn't my favorite bet of the week, but I'm trying to reverse psychology myself once again. I put it here because I want to talk about it first, because it's the first game of the week, and you just segmented me perfectly. I'm going Jackson State, plus three and a half. As Bree says, this game is Wednesday night, so bet it now. Bet it as you're listening, hopefully Wednesday morning. Jacksonville State is quietly 4-1 and one to begin their time in FBS play. Yes, they've played five teams that stink, but Middle Tennessee stinks, so it's kind of the point. I think this team profiles very similar to James Madison when you're looking at what they do well. They're currently eighth in the country in success rate right, on defense. They're 24th at preventing finishing drives. They're 37th at limiting explosiveness. They're excellent against the run. They ha- and they have the sixth highest rushing rate in the nation. Run the ball, play good defense. That's exactly what James Madison has been doing for two years. The only difference is they do it at the fastest pace in the entire country. So it looks different, but it's the same concept of just run the ball, play D. I know you were high on Zion Webb coming into the air, but I've really liked what I've seen from Logan Smothers. He took over... What, like two week week one, I guess. Zion Webb started week one. They kind of alternated. Webb started one, Smothers started two. Zion Webb started three, Smothers started four. I think they're going with Smothers moving forward. At least I hope they are. He threw three touchdowns last week against the Sam Houston's defense that looked pretty good. His five touchdowns, no picks on the year. He's added five touchdowns on the ground. I kind of thought Webb was more the dual threat. Smothers, can he can scoot too. He's also a former four-star recruit. He spent three years at Nebraska. He's no slouch that's just coming from you know the FCS level. He's coming from Nebraska. We've seen Malik Jackson run the ball great, the ULM transfer. He's averaging 6.5 yards per carry. Anwar Lewis, who was their leading back last year, he made a season debut last week. Really didn't do much, but I think he's going to get more involved moving forward. And Middle Tennessee's offense is terrible. I talk about them every week. They suck. Their defense is even worse. They're 110th in success rate. 111th against the run, which, as I said, is kind of all the Gamecocks want to do. And Middle Tennessee can't stop the run. And Middle Tennessee ranks 133rd, dead last in the country, at preventing finishing drives. 
So all Jacksonville State needs to do is get past the 40, and they should expect points. Jacksonville State plus three and a hook. I don't get it. They should be favored in this game. If Jacksonville State was minus two and a half, it'd still probably be on my card. So catching over a field goal seems crazy to me. I bet Middle Tennessee, I bet against them most of uh, pretty much every episode, and I don't think I've lost betting against them yet. So give me the Gamecocks at three and a hook. And honestly, I thought about them for my money line dog. I think they win the game. Yeah, I think that's a great play. It's a part of my round robin, so I'll save a little bit of commentary there. But, you know, the last two weeks, Middle Tennessee's played Colorado State and Western Kentucky. Not exactly world beaters defensively. They've scored 33 total points in those two games. So one of the biggest shocks in Conference USA, I thought that the Gamecocks would come in and be potent. We talked about their Little Caesars hot and ready offense. It's been okay. Their defense has been incredible. I, I understand that they played some bad teams and they've, you know, padded their stats in that regard. This is a bad team, to your point. <laughs> so let's just go ahead and use that defense that lives in, you know, opponents' backfields against an offense that gives up a lot of havoc. So I, I'll share some more thoughts on that in the round robin. Um, for my best bet, I'm going back to the well. Anyone watching here on YouTube, you can see the Colorado State helmet, the shirt. We've been banging the drum. It took a little time out of the gate. They got smoked by Washington State, who now clearly is a legit team. They lose in a thriller to Colorado. There's no shame in that. They're only laying a point and a half in Logan, Utah, against Utah State. And I don't really understand why, because this offense is rocking. Braden Fowler and Nicolosi has been incredible. Ten TDs through three starts. He's not perfect, nor is the offensive line. But the offensive line has improved, I would argue, over you know any metric, over 100 points in terms of like their rank nationally. They're now 23rd in sacks allowed per game. They were dead last in the FBS last year. So they're finally giving their quarterback time to operate. And they're up against, you know, this Utah State team. Oh, man. Utah State's defense, is, I can't stress how bad they are. They're 130th in success rate, 110th in sacks per game. They let UConn drop 33 on them. They let James Madison nuke them for 45 points. And here comes the best receiving core, in my opinion, wide receivers and tight end in all of the group of five. Torrey Horton is a god. If he could run off the field right into the arms of a agent and just sign a contract right now, I think he should. Jay Norvell has clearly righted the ship. So I would play this all the way up to six and a half, to be honest. I think it's that far off from my projections. I'm going to play it on the alternate line. I think you're going to be able to get plus 185, plus 175 on your money, teasing up right below a touchdown. So that's why it's my best bet here. I know that Utah State historically has been sometimes a difficult play to, place to play in the Mountain West, but the Rams offense is by far the best unit on the field here, and Utah State doesn't have any answers right now. So barring something crazy, barring an injury and you know bring Millen back in, I just see another huge performance. We'll call it north of 35 points for the Rams. The round round robin here, our G5 high five. We're going to go ahead and give you five picks, bundle them together, five leg parlay, you know, do these round robins by threes, by twos, try to put it together in a responsible way so that you can cash some money, even if they go four and one. Let's get started with your pick here in week six. Yeah, I'm going back to well, same way, same way I cashed fade in Middle Tennessee last week. I cashed fade in Utah State last week as well. Still don't think they're any good. And yeah, last week was kind of that weird catch 22 because. UConn stormed all the way back, was about to force overtime, while the blocked extra punt or the blocked PAT did secure our UConn plus six and a half ticket. It pretty much buried our UConn win total. So RIP to that. But we did cash that ticket. The Huskies outgained them in that game. They outgained Utah State 473 to 416. We've talked about the problems with this Husky offense, especially the passing game. Uh, with, I totally just blanked on his name. What their yeah, quarterback R- Roberson? Yeah. No, who's who was the original guy? Vigiano uh, got hurt. Yes. And Roberson had to come back in. Roberson can't pass, and he threw for 255 yards. They also ran all over Utah State. So you mentioned how bad this defense is, and you you kind of tipped on it. Where our biggest concern coming into the year was this Colorado State offensive line. Not only have they been improved, but as you said, Utah State has seven sacks all season. They're 110th in the country. They rank 132nd in the country in generating pressure. They are going to have all day to sit in the pocket and find Horton, Ross Simmons, Hoker, and all of these weapons. And yeah, Fowler Nicolosi, just he has such a higher ceiling than Millen. He's having 383 yards per game. The one issue, too many interceptions. 
for the love of God, if he protects the football, they should shred this defense. Another big story here is someone who I was, made that UConn bet a little bit more nervous for me was McKay Hillstead had looked good at quarterback. He left that UConn game with a concussion. As of Tuesday morning, he is still day-to-day. The way they handle concussions nowadays, I mean, it's more the NFL. Mm-hmm. It's You almost never see a guy get a concussion and play the following week. Cooper Lagasse sucks. We've talked about it for two years. He stinks. He has 17 touchdowns and 11 interceptions in two years. But if you flip it, he has 11 big-time throws and 17 turnover-worthy plays. So even the 17-11, which isn't good, is misleading. He's been way worse than that. I completely agree with you, everything you said. I think Colorado State should shred this defense. And I don't trust Cooper Lega to keep up with this offense because I think he stinks. So I agree with you. This line was nuts to me. So give me the Rams. I'll go ahead and piggyback on your Jacksonville State plus three and a half play here in midweek. Look at that. The Mike and Mike show. You know, handshake emojis all over the place. You hit on all the key points. I just want to throw in here. The Jacksonville State defense really stout against the run. Middle Tennessee, 101st in, in run success rate. So they can't run the ball. They're going to have to abandon it. But really, Middle Tennessee is going to run into huge trouble because they allow havoc. This offensive line is not good. They're 108th in allowing defensive havoc against a Jacksonville State defense that's 14th nationally in TFLs per game. They're going to live in this backfield. There's going to be turnovers off of it. And I think, as you mentioned, a great defense. We know what we're getting offensively. Not only has Logan Smothers been really effective and you know threw three TDs against Sam Houston State, no picks. So basically what we're begging for Fowler and Nicolosi to do, he's already doing at the G5 level. So I really like that. I'm going to stay in the Mountain West. We were just talking about Colorado State and Utah State. Fresno State traveling to Wyoming. Wyoming catching six. This is just, Laredice is a place where favorites go to die. And I'm just looking at this from a lot of different perspectives. Let's start with this. Before kickoff, about an hour before, it's going to be 65 degrees, kind of lulling that California team into a false sense of security. By the fourth quarter, according to weatherunderground.com, it's going to be 32 degrees with 15 mile an hour winds. Now let's look at something else. Since 2019, Wyoming is eight and two against the closing number in their last 10 as a home dog. They love this spot. Craig Bull always gets his team up for spots like this. They won six of those 10 outright. And they just do all the little things right. I mean, they have great special teams. They're 20th in S&P+. They can really run it now that Harrison Whaley is healthy. The kid's averaging 8.5 yards per carry, over 150 yards per game, found an end zone in every game since coming back from injury. And the defense makes you earn it in multiple ways. They're 25th in limiting explosives. And they played a really good schedule. They played Texas Tech, Texas, and App State. So they're not playing you know doormats. They've been able to generate a lot of these impressive defensive stats by playing quality non-conference opponents. Another thing that they make you really earn it, they rarely turn the ball over. Just one per game thus far. Teams are only converting 52% of their red zone trips into TDs, which is impressive impressive given their opponents. And they don't kill themselves with penalties. 23rd fewest in yardage allowed through penalties this year. So Craig Bowles is a guy I always like to bet. I understand you got to hold your nose. This passing game is non-existent. The Fresno defense looks to be getting stronger. But I have questions about Mikey Keene. There's, this offense does, certainly does not have the Jake Hayner pixie dust sprinkled all over it. There's moments when the running game looks a little bit out of whack. There's moments when it looks like it's a dink and dunk passing game. Eric Brooks had a hot start to the season, kind of fell off last week. So to me, I'm going to go ahead and take the points in a place that has been very, very good to the pokes in terms of covering games as a home underdog. I'll go ahead and take the pokes here. And really, if you put a gun to my head, the the reason why I'm so confident on this is Harrison Whaley. Like, he, he needs to play big, and I think he's going to be able to do it even running into one of the better Mountain West run defenses. What are your thoughts on this one up in Laramie? Yeah, I'm glad you did all the research on this game, uh, but I will actually talk about that later. All right, excellent. What do you got next? Uh, for my next play, a team that well, we were talking before the show – and you faded Bowling Green last week, and it did not. Didn't work out great. Unbelievable. Just I guess once a year, just Scott Leffler pulls out his "you can't fire me" card. Beats Toledo outright. Beats Georgia Tech. Just absolute freaking nonsense. So yes, and I think this is a perfect spot to fade Bowling Green. Yes, there uh, you go. 
after an upset win of three touchdowns, a three touchdown underdogs to Georgia Tech. Again, luckily none of us were dumb enough to fade the jack bet on the jackets, but I'm gonna fade the Falcons here. So as you mentioned, they've done this before. And they fall flat afterwards. You mentioned they, you know, 2019, that that terrible 2019 team that beat Toledo got trucked the next week to Central Michigan. 2021, beat Minnesota on the road, come back, lose to Kent State the following week. I think it's the perfect spot to fade them. And that game was weird. Like, I'm not saying you were on the right side, but it was a weird game. Georgia yeah, Tech- when I was looking into the, the box score, because I was at the Auburn-Georgia game, and I was just saying to myself, oh, like, you know, they must have lost a bunch of fumbles. They you must, know, you know, must have got killed with penalties. Like, where was it? I was looking for basically the murder weapon in the situation of Bowling Green taking them out, and I couldn't find it. Well, Georgia, well, Georgia Tech had, had three turnovers, including a, a pick six. But it was just like they never had the ball. They Georgia Tech had a 51% success rate in that game. The Yellow Jackets had 8.2 yards per play compared to 5.7 for Bowling Green. Bowling Green had nine explosive plays. They first they forced three turnovers. Like I said, one of them was a pick six. The Yellow Jackets only had the ball for 17 minutes in this game, yet they had over 400 yards of offense. They threw a pick six. They turned it over on downs at the 14-yard line, and it was just a weird game. And I still don't think Bowling Green's good. They're still 110th in success rate on offense. They're 98th on defense. Connor Bazelak has like the yips. He looks terrified every time he drops back to pass. Like he hasn't got hit that much, but he looks like he's like afraid to get hit. He looks shaky and jittery and he does not look calm in the pocket. He has four touchdowns, five interceptions, completing 59% of his passes. And for such a veteran quarterback, you'd think like this would be easy. He was facing the Big Ten last year. Now he like looks, I don't know, he just looks off. Miami, Ohio hasn't played the toughest schedule, but I was high on them coming in, and I still am. They're 14th in the country at creating explosiveness. Brett Gabbard's got nine touchdowns this season. He's got an A dot of 13.6. Big thing here is our boy Gage Larvidane was hurt last week, uh, but Chuck Martin said it seems like he should be back this week. He said he's pushing for him to come back, and he expects him to be back. He's averaged 109.5 yards per game. 24 yards per catch he is he that 14th in explosiveness they need larva dane to do that so him getting back is obviously huge and this defense is terrific against the run and they you know they've struggled they're really good at creating havoc which is an area bowling green has struggled so i think they're going to be able to get after Bazelac. they're going to have to slow they're going to slow this running game down which is kind of what bowling green's been decent at i still don't trust their passing attack and i think this is a big letdown spot for bowling green coming off of a power five win Miami's had just one home game all year. It's kind of been a weird schedule, and that was against an FCS school. So they should get up for this one at home, kind of as much as a MAC team can. Uh, yeah, I just think I just like the spot here, and, and I'm I'm still going with the uh, with Miami here. Yeah, I, I love it. I love the guts on it. Um, you know, you want to play those those letdown spots. Gage Larvardane is the key for me. So I would just you know have it chambered until some news comes out. Go ahead, follow on Twitter. There's great beat writers all across the country and and certainly in Mac country, there's lots of different resources to be able to check in on him. But as someone who I had him on my fantasy college roster, he, he got hurt against Delaware state. There was a question. Could he come back in the game? You know, they were running away with it. So hopefully he's a go because if he is, he's the best big play threat in the Mac. All right. I'm going to go to the Sun Belt, And for those of you watching online, I got my Sun Belt family photo here with all of the schools. One of my prized possessions now I'm going to go ahead and lay Texas State minus one against Louisiana. This line line makes no sense. I mean, this, I think, is predicated on the fact that if you just look at the win-loss column, Raging Cajun's got three wins. I'm going to go full Bill Murray and Kingpin. Ooh, Northwestern State, UAB, Buffalo. I I don't care about that. (laughs) I'm also going to throw this out here. You know, they lose to Old Dominion, who I think is one of the worst FBS schools. But the old, the old Bruce Feldman, like body blow theory, it used to be, you know, if you play service academies, they just played Minnesota. They gave up over 200 yards rushing. Minnesota ran it, ran it, ran it, ran it. I think they're going to be beat up in their front seven. And this is critical because here comes this Texas State offense. We had high hopes for G.J. Kenny's offense in year one, at least to be entertaining. They've been a lot more than entertaining. They're four and one coming into this game, and they've been so well balanced offensively. Now they're up against a Raging Cajuns defense that's 101st in havoc, so they're not in the defensive backfield. They're not breaking up passes. They're 110th in rushing success rate. And one of the best-kept secrets in the entire 
country. Ishmael Mahadi, small running back. So basically they were able to pluck him from Houston Christian. He's, you know, under 5'10". He's probably realistically like 165, 170 pounds. He was a Jerry Rice Award finalist. What's the Jerry Rice Award? It's the best freshman in the FCS. Since he's come up, they basically worked him in a little bit against Baylor and that upset. Since then, he's been killing it out of nowhere. He leads the nation in all-purpose yards by over 20 yards per game over the next player in the country, like running, receiving, kick returns. This guy is incredible. The offense is red hot. They're just, you know, dropping 30, 40, 50 point nuggets. Finley has been a revelation. He was somebody who struggled with accuracy at Auburn. He comes in, he's looking really good running this offense. Uh, that you you don't think Auburn wishes they had him right now though? I mean certainly. So, I mean he, he, Auburn beats Georgia if they have TJ Finley at quarterback. I, I don't think you're wrong. I mean, certainly if he's running this offense at Texas State and not what Hugh Freeze was trying to do, you know, down there on the plains. Um, they also use Malik Hornsby in another SEC uh, retread. They use him in the running game a little bit from time to time. I just think the fact that they're not favored by four to five points, I don't think it's way off because it is a road game. But I think this is still predicated on that Billy Napier effect of Louisiana ran things in the Sun Belt West for years. They're just not that team. And I think at this point, they're a paper tiger propped up by an FCS win, a win over Trent Dilfer, and a win over a Buffalo team that you eloquently said in one of the most recent episodes. They don't do anything well. So I'm going to go ahead and take a team that is really dynamic on offense. I think they're certainly a top 10 group of five offense. They have it all together. And Madi's my guy. So I'm going to go ahead. He's probably going to be my G5 hero next week when he pops off for 200 all-purpose yards. I'll close out our... Group of five, high five, round robin here in week six with that one. Any closing thoughts on the Bobs? Yeah, I'd written down, and uh, you know, sometimes if we get if we have time, we'll talk about our other games we left on the cutting room floor. That was absolutely on mine. It honestly, it almost I almost made it my money line dog, but it seemed like cheating because they're like a one point dog. Uh, it, I don't get it. I think they're a much better team than Louisiana. You know, for my money line upset here, we like to put together two dogs, our group of five underdog money line parlay in week six. I don't necessarily think that one team is that much better than the other, but it's kind of predicated on the fact that, as you like to say, if you close your eyes and you see New Mexico State lose to FIU, do you even pause for a moment? The fact of the matter is they're plus 235 on the money line FIU. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because the Aggies defense is 130th in SP+. Our TAN, that's the Action Network Power Rankings for New Mexico State, is 121st. I believe FIU's 125, 126. So they're, it's definitely in the realm of possibility for them to go in and beat the Aggies in Las Cruces. And this New Mexico State team, having watched a lot, we talk about Diego Pavia, we talk about their offensive explosiveness, and they can pop some big plays. But they're also inconsistent. They commit a lot of penalties. Offensively, they're awful in the red zone with the 11th worst touchdown percentage in the entire country. And I like uh, Kiwan Jenkins, their quarterback for FIU, running this offense. I like them to regroup. They got absolutely blasted by Liberty after a three and one start. But Liberty may be the best group of five team. They may be competing for that New Year's Six bowl game by year's end and being a top 25 team. If so, that changes the dynamic. I, I believe they went 38 to six over the Panthers. I don't hold that against them. I like the fact that they got their bye week. They were able to lick their wounds. And this is a critical game, a winnable game. So I think plus 235 is too generous. Anything over, you know, two to one, I think is a, a must play for this spot for FIU. What are your thoughts? This is an absolute garbage pile pick, but I'm going to go ahead with FIU in the spot. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I can't believe you're fading your boy Diego Diego. That's, that's my only really thought. I, I, can't, I can't do it anymore. The, the guy is so wildly inconsistent. And this defense was really what kind of made their run special last year when they won, what, six of seven or five of six to finish the year. They were so good against the pass. They had so many new faces, you know, this spring. And they were, you know, doing all the coach speak and the positivity. And it was Jerry Kill. I, I gave him his respect. This is a guy who I think at the end of his career has a chance to make an argument to be in the College Football Hall of Fame. Like he's been so impactful as a coach and certainly as a defensive mind. This defense stinks. It stinks out loud. There's nothing they can do from a personnel standpoint. Um, and really it just comes down to Jenkins taking care of the football and being efficient, something that he was doing earlier in the season when he, you know, took over as their QB one. I'm just hoping that they don't have any pause. They don't go back to Grayson James 
and they stick with this kid who's a true freshman because I think he's a winner. I mentioned it before. He was a three-time state champion, Miami-Dade High School Player of the Year. Kid's a baller. Another guy that Auburn should have had a quarterback. He, he was an Auburn decommit. They could have used him on Saturday against the Bulldogs. You better be careful. If New Mexico State wins this game, Pavia might come and pee on your carpet. <laughs> Listen, if he does, I am not going to take a video of it and then quote unquote leak it out to the press. That'll just be between me and Diego. <laughs> All right, for mine, my money line underdog, we touched on it. I'm going Wyoming plus 200. And I'm I'm glad you did all the research and did all the notes because, and, and let me be clear, I think Fresno State's really good. I'm a believer. This has nothing to do with the Fresno State. I have one sentence written down in my notes. Weird shit happens at night in Laramie. That's all I wrote down. And I, as you were talking, I was pulling up some stats to kind of back it up. Because unless, unless you're satisfied with my explanation being weird shit happens at night in Laramie. I think it, it's a fair point. There, it, or You don't have to go back that far. Weird shit happened in that Texas Tech game. Texas Tech, what were they up? 17 nothing. Three scores in that game. And then all hell broke loose. Because basically when the sun goes down, it becomes like the Mountain West version of Death Valley with LSU. Just... Weird stuff starts going on. I mentioned the weather. Like, it, there's it's, it's always like the, the like you said the 15 mile an hour crosswinds, and you know Fresno State wants to throw the ball with Keen. That's hard to do in the wind. And you know since Craig Bull took all since since Craig well Craig Bull took over in 14, but it kind of took him like two years to get things going. Mm -hmm. Since he's got things rolling over the last eight years, since 2016, they are 32 and 12 at home. They're 11 and 10 straight up as a home dog since 2016 that is the 15th best winning percentage as a home dog and the most wins of any team in the country as a home dog 11 wins straight up as a home dog and you know to support your bet they're 15 and 6 as against the spread as a home dog since 2016 71.4 percent covering and i'm just gonna use them as my money line dog here because i think it's like you said it's just one of those things where you won't be even a little it's also like the perfect like fresno state just finally got ranked they go into laramie and lose like that just seems almost too obvious i feel so weird shit happens at night in laramie yeah this is the part of the season where you know to just state the obvious by the end of the year we'll know how exactly how good purdue and arizona state are if they're both non-bowl teams it's nice that fresno state beat them but it doesn't seem quite as impressive. And that Arizona State game was totally Looney Tunes. They had like eight or nine turnovers. And Fresno State still only scored, what, 29 points. So we're back in play. Right. So I think they certainly deserve to be ranked. Their defense is legitimate. But it's it's almost like the floor is so low for the Wyoming offense. I, I'm not banking on them picking up 450 yards and scoring 35 points. I'm banking on them turning, in this, turning this into a rock fight. And I think... If we squint a little bit, there's something just off about this Fresno State offense. So I'm with you. You may as well swing for the fence as we put this one together. This is going to be, you know, one of those money line parlays that pays off and pays, the, you know, the whole season my, worth of red just washes it away and puts us in the black. Part of my feeling, too, is even if you're high on Fresno State and you believe in them, like you could tell me right now, Fresno State's going to win the Mountain West. And I'd say I could see it. Like, I honestly, if I had to pick right now, I think Fresno State plays Air Force in the Mountain West championship game. And wouldn't it just make so much sense for the Mountain West champions to lose in Laramie? Like that happens every year. <laughs> Miami is going to go eight and four and they're going to beat, you know, the, the Mountain West champion in Laramie. That's just, that's what they do every year. Some programming notes before we get out of here, as always on Thursday, Colin and Stuck doing the full FBS card, going through every single game, their trash picks, the marquee matchups, talking injuries, talking about quarterback changes, there's also the new BCS show, which is in, already in your podcast feed. Tim Kalinowski, Brett McMurphy, Colin, and Stuck. It's been really entertaining. If you want to just break up a little bit of the, the pure picks, getting into the angles of the upcoming games, they do a good job of looking at college football from that 40,000-foot view. Some trivia questions, always some fun banner between those four. And then on Saturday, our BBOC live show that brings McMurphy, Colin, Stuck back together. They go through all the last piece of information, the steam movements, the last minute injury updates, the weather. That's the last thing that you want to look at before locking in your plays on Saturday. All right, let's close out with some cutting room floor action. What games were you almost there to pull the trigger on? I mentioned Texas State. I have it written down. You also mentioned Old Dominion. 
do we do we start buying back into Southern Miss? They've looked terrible, mm-hmm. but one and a half, playing one and a half at home against Old Dominion. This feels like if Southern Miss is going to get right at any point, it feels like it's going to be this week. So I may have to ride with Southern Miss. I know you're probably on this. South Florida, you, you mentioned maybe South Florida minus three and a half. I don't love laying the three and a hook. If this gets to three or under, I may have to ride with South Florida. I also want to take this opportunity to just, since I know you've piled on a lot, I don't want to seem like you're just the hater. Trent Dilfer is such a piece of shit. And I almost made my G5 here of the week, the, the defensive coordinator that he, that, that's who he was, he was yelling at, right? The defensive well, coordinator. Well, I mean, this may come as a surprise. I watched the whole press conference on Monday. He uh, said that he apologized. He, he didn't like how he acted. He was ashamed of it. But he no, wanted to clarify. Can. He was yelling at everybody because he was yelling on the, the, the mic. So he had the headset on. And yes, that was the guy closest to him. But he wouldn't get into specifics. But something big got screwed up. And that's why he was so mad. And why yeah, he, he got was called for like, like illegal, they got called for an illegal substitution, and he like lost it. They were down like twenty at the time. He lost his mind. If a grown man yells at it, I almost gave him my the defense according to my G five here of the week for not slapping the taste out of his mouth. Because if a grown man yells at you like that in public, you have no choice but to hit him. And I almost made him my G five here of the week for not hitting him. But I may have to play South Florida if this number gets to three or below. And then the last one, I don't know if I'm going to play. I just wanted to bring it up to you to float it out there. We mentioned, you know, the the. will you be surprised at this result on Sunday morning? Would you be surprised if Marshall beats NC State? Um, if Brennan Armstrong was still the quarterback, I'd be interested because he stinks and he's just not working. And this Robert and I reunion is ill-fated. But I actually like MJ Morris. And I so think this would be, be – yeah. I'm, I'm still traumatized from betting on him in the Mayo Bowl. and. It was like they were actively trying to lose that game. I, I, I am dead serious. I think Dave Doran wanted so badly not to get Mayo dumped on him that he <laughs> the Mayo ball. I, I will go to my grave believing that because I watched every snap of that game. And Dave Doran did everything he could not to win that game. And MJ Moore started in that game. And I'm a little traumatized from that. I know you're not one to swing for the fences on your money line underdog, and you have a lot more wins over the last two, three years than I do in that department, so I'm not going to critique. But UTSA at this point, Frank Harris is still in that, like, what's wrong with his foot situation, Dr. Frank. They're a 14 point favorite at Temple this season. If he doesn't play, no, 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 Temple no, no, is no, absolutely no, a live no, dog. No, there, right? no, 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 no. Temple okay. is garbage. I bet on Temple okay. like maybe every week. They stink. Calabrese Temple might be in podcast jail. Okay. All right. Then I will finish it with, I'll take your (laughs) word for that one. That's fair. The one I was interested in is, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah. San Jose State is catching 10. That one I thought. Against against Boise State. I know that San Jose State's broken. We we had our fears in the preseason. They lose, what, two defensive players of the year in back-to-back years on their defensive line. It's clear that they can't stop anybody. That Air Force offense is ruthlessly efficient. They, I mean, if you read Bill Connolly's work for ESPN, he gets into the remaining undefeated teams. He just wrote a love letter to the Air Force offense, and they deserve it. They get in the red zone. They score touchdowns. They are always ahead of the sticks. But I still like the San Jose State offense. I think 10 may be a little much. Um, and really, I think this is, this is it. This is the their last stand situation. Cause if they start the season one and five, I think it's going to be too much of a hole to dig out of. So I think you're at least going to get an inspired effort. Maybe I would lean, you know, if you can catch him plus five, plus five and a half in the first half against a Boise state offense that certainly now with Gene T is they're running it through him, but I still don't think they know properly how to use tail and green. Um, even though they looked good in defeat against Memphis, but 10 just feels like a lot. What are your thoughts there? I agree. I had that not written down, but like, it was. I thought about it just because you look at yes, you know San Jose State one and four. It's like they lost to USC, they lost to Oregon State, they lost to Toledo, who's going to win the MAC. They lost to Air Force, who's probably going to win the Mountain West. So it's like I, I'm not like totally out on San Jose State, and I, I wouldn't maybe play him as an under. I wouldn't play him as a dog, like a money line dog. But I agree with you. Ten, ten's a lot of points, especially when you said. Boise's like really leaning into that running game. And yeah, I just think 10, I agree with you that 10's a lot. 
All right. For Mike Ionello, I'm Mike Calabrese. This has been the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM, our group of five deep dive now in the books. Absolutely reach out on, you know, reviews, shoot us some notes. Five-star reviews are always appreciated. I'm happy to throw out some free $10 parlays of your choosing if you do so. Um, our YouTube channel as well is where you can find all of our shorts and full episodes. Comment there. We'd love to chop it up with you as well. And over on Twitter, I'm at East Breeze. That's E-A-S-T-B-R-E-E-S-E on Twitter. X. What did that one guy on YouTube say the other day? He we, he we talked about how gross all the games were, and he goes... I wouldn't watch these games if they were in my kitchen. <laughs> yeah, I think that that was absolutely hilarious. If he wants to reach out, I'm happy to. Yeah, just hit me up on Twitter. I'm happy to give you a, t- a $10 parlay just for that one. I mean, looking at my full slate that's, here. That's why we're here. I, we're telling you, don't watch FIU. Breeze, bet it. He's going to watch it. Bet it with us. Breeze will watch it. And then next week, we'll tell you what happened. Don't watch these games. I mean, the ones the Wednesday night games are perfect to watch, but like. No, watch the good games. <laughs> that's why we watch the bad ones, and that's why we come on here and tell you what you know what we think is going to happen because we watch them, so you don't have to. You're welcome. Hey, Kiwan Jenkins, if you win this game and you're in fact playing it in my kitchen, I will grab you an uncrustable Nutella variety because they're absolute bomb. They're fire. I don't just give them to my kids. I give them to anybody, particularly guys who win money line bets for me in yeah, my or, own or, house. Or Pavia will pee in your kitchen. <laughs> All right, that's it for us. I'll see you next week. Best of luck on Saturday.